Our Heavenly Father, we truly thank you for how you watch over and protect us. Thank you for watching over each of our family members, our loved ones. We are so grateful for your mercy uh, that is new every morning. We ask you to just continue to draw our hearts closer to you uh, through difficult times and through blessing times from our perspective, but we want to know you, we want to honor you and serve you and exalt Christ in these dark days. All for your glory. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Well, we are looking at Jehovah Nissi. Um, I hope as we're doing this study, you're starting to listen for the buzzwords, name of God. I mean, I'm amazed at how many songs talk about the name of God or when Jeff talks about the name of God, it's like all of a sudden you, you start becoming much more attuned to where it's used in scripture, how it's used. And here's just another verse, John 17, 11, where Jesus is doing his high priestly prayer. He says, I will remain in the world no longer, speaking to his father, but they are still in the world and I am coming to you. And then he says this, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. And not only is it the name of the Son of God, but also every other name that he has, because it takes all of those names to truly get a clearer picture of how great, how awesome our God is. We are so frail in our humanity, and for us to even think we can start to climb the mountain sometimes of knowing God more intimate, it's almost impossible, but yet he beckons us to come. He wants us to understand him. He wants us to know him more. So we have covered uh, the Elohim names, El Elyon, El Roi, El Shaddai. We talked about Adonai. Um, we have then discussed Jehovah, which is the eternal, personal, present God with me. Uh, we talked about Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, and now today we'll talk Jehovah Nissi. Um, again, his name <clears throat> is a revelation. It's just another way that God wants to reveal himself to you. I mean, why, is, why do you as a parent teach your child your name? So that if there's a crisis, they can call upon you. Not just when they need money, but when there's, when there's a need, they can call because they know that name. They know there's a special connection. The same thing with us. So um, God has done a big miracle, and he's, he's going to teach us through the example and the trials and the failures of the Israelites as they came out of Egypt. And the children of Israel, they're all joyful at Pharaoh's defeat, crossing the Straits of Ty Tyron there. Um, incredible miracle. It, I, I mean, when you can rent the DVD Blu-ray high def in heaven, you'll, you'll be astounded at really how magnificent <laughs> this miracle truly was. And so the enemy has learned if he can't beat us in his defeat, he will wait till we're a little bit off guard and then he will come after us to steal our victory or joy or wisdom. So right after a spiritual win or a spiritual victory, Satan attacks the children of Israel at Mara with frustration, discouragement, unexpected news. <coughs> Sound like you can relate to that. So Satan is a master of trying to catch us off guard. He knows God is going to win the battles, <clears throat> but his strategy is to come after us when we're when we've dropped our guard down a little bit. If you're in the middle of a battle, uh, you, you're, you're fighting hard. You're not dropping your shield. But after the battle's over, that's when the enemy comes in and starts to make his attack. So he's going to take them. God, God is going to take them across the straits. Then he's going to take them to Mara. Then he's going to take them to the, the wilderness of sin. It's not sin like disobedience sin. Uh, then he's going to take them to Rephidim. That's where we're going to be today. And then, of course, they finally end up at Mount Hor, Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai. So after the grumbling at the Red Sea, Jehovah protected and rescued them. Now he leads them to various locations. Those locations, he's going to use them to do two things. He's going to test their hearts to see how well do they know me, how well will they trust me. And two, he's revealing his names through these locations, the events at these locations. So you say, why are we studying Exodus when we're doing a name of God study? Because that's where, that's how and where God reveals himself to us is in these locations. And so you have to understand what's happening at these locations for that to take place. Have you ever thought maybe God designs, orchestrates, or allows difficulties into your life to test your heart, to see how well have you grown? Have you matured? Does the flat tire send you into a complete meltdown? Or can you take that in stride? Trust God. I'm not saying you don't feel anything. 
but can you take it in stride and say, God, if what is the purpose in this mini disaster? Uh, lead the right person to me, bring me to the right person, L let my life be a testimony, or like I said, are you in a complete meltdown mode? So maybe God designs, orchestrates, or allows difficulties into your life to test your heart, but maybe more so God designs those, those trials, difficulties into our life so that he can reveal more of his heart to you. And when you start seeing difficulties that way, that, that, that is going to produce uh, spiritual maturity in a big way. He wants you to know his power, his presence, his provision much more than you even want to know him. When they came to Marl, they could not drink its water because it was bitter. That is why the place is called Marl. You know, somebody should have looked on the map and said, hey, we're going to a water hole, but it's named Mara. I mean, that's like going down the street and you want to stop at a rest stop called Broken Down. Maybe we shouldn't stop there. <laughs> Let's pass the next one, see what's going on. So the people grumbled against Moses because they said, what are we to drink? Okay, then we <clears throat> covered this extensively the week before. <clears throat> God gives them sweet rest. What did Moses throw in the bitter water to make it sweet? Specifically? Yeah. Now, did it look like a wooden cross? No, no. But the word in the Septuagint is zulon, and zulon is the same word for they hung him on a cross. So the, 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 you can translate it as a tree, as a stake, as a spike, as a cross. Any of those words all come from the same zulon word. And that's because when Peter preaches the gospel in Acts chapter 2, he uses the word zulon. You, you, this generation, you turned him over and you crucified him on a tree or on a cross. Same word. So, again, <clears throat> what a type. That, that wood, that cross, that, that tree represented what Christ would do to turn our bitter lives into sweetness. So, uh, then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs and 70 palm trees, and they camped there near the water. Now remember, they're in Saudi Arabia. They're, they're outside of Egypt's boundary and territory at this point. But <clears throat> after the battle, God gave them rest. And he is so tender-hearted to do that. You know, uh, Mark chapter 6, uh, the disciples come back, and they'd been ministering and ministering and ministering, and it says they didn't even have time to eat. And Jesus says, Mark 6, 31, Come, come away, come to a quiet place, and let's rest. I mean, there is, there is time and places where your body literally needs to rest, and Jesus took those times as well. Um, another time <clears throat> when rest was key was, remember Elijah on Mount Carmel after he had that huge um, display of God's power where all the prophets of Baal were killed? And then, of course, it's, I mean, you talk about a mountaintop experience, that was it. And then all of a sudden, he gets word that Jezebel has made a curse, that she will kill herself unless she has Elijah's head by the next day. Well, I mean, you'd think Elijah would go, eh, I'm bulletproof now. He completely lost it. That threat was um, a, a, a real satanic attack on his one weakness of fear. And so what he, has, what he does is he flees. And then he comes to a juniper tree and lays under it and just says, God, I'm just like my forefathers. Just take my life. I'm done. I mean, he's basically saying, I quit. Here's the towel. Throw the towel in. And what happens? He falls asleep. Then God sends angel, probably Michael or Gabriel, whoever cooks the best. They cook up this dinner for him. They have it all ready. And it's like, Elijah, wake up. Elijah, wake up. Elijah, wake up. And he wakes up. And there's these hot coals cooking bread. And he's got water and everything there. And, and then he goes back to sleep again. And then the angel does the same thing again. So must have been thinking, can't you just call, you know, a, a delivery service and get the thing for this guy? It's like, does it again, cooks the food. But, but then after that, he runs 240 miles to Mount Horeb, Mount, Mount Sinai, where we're at. And that's where he really came to a close place with God. So sometimes God is going to take you into a tough spot to help you learn of your maturity and also learn more of his heart for you. And then after that tough time, God's going to give you rest because you need it physically, spiritually, and emotionally as well. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. When you lie down, your sleep will be sweet. <clears throat> the whole Israelite community set out from Elam. So they'd been there in Elam, pine tr or, uh, palm trees. 
uh, springs, everybody got water, the livestock got watered, everything is going good. Then they come to the desert of sin. Now somebody should have looked up on the map and said, this is going to be a desert. Maybe there's no water here. I don't know why they don't think this. They're in the desert and they're like worried that, they're not worried that they run out of water. Then when they run out of water, they're like all freaked out. On the 15th day of the second month, so this is about 45 days since they've left Egypt. Um, the, in the desert, the whole community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. I mean, you know, some people get up in the morning and take a vitamin. It seems like every one of these Jews take a grumble pill because all they do is they get up and they just start grumbling about the d difficult situations. <laughs> Thank goodness we never do that. <laughs> <laughs> then it says, the Israelites said to Moses and Aaron, if we had only died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you've brought us out here into this desert to starve us the entire assembly to death. What do you think about their level of spiritual spiritual maturity? Uh, they're, they're definitely angry. Now, every single person, probably not. The majority, yes, definitely. Well, in the wilderness, the Lord will respond to that. And I find this amazing of the heart of God. Sometimes, even when we're maybe not so kind in how we say things to God, or we're a bit abrupt, or we're a bit... Not, not good in how we speak sometimes in our hearts to God, he responds, the Lord said to Moses, I've heard the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them at twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will be filled with bread. Then you will know that I am Jehovah, the eternal, personal, present God, your Elohim. <clears throat> so God was going to handle that by providing food in the morning, food at night. He was going to take care of their needs. And I think there's one reason God didn't turn this into, because remember, sometimes when they grumble, grumble, God would send serpents, or God would send a fire, or God would discipline a lot of them. Here, he doesn't do that. Here, he go ahead, it's almost like he sidesteps the grumbling for the time being, and instead, he, he provides nourishment for them. And the reason he's providing nourishment is there is a big storm coming. They have got to be physically, emotionally, spiritually ready for what's about to come. But once again, they start grumbling. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling to place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. So they were in the desert of sin. They were there in the, in the yellow circle, the desert of sin. They were there, and they, and they actually went to a couple different places. Moses doesn't cover it here, but they went to probably about 30 different places all throughout this journey. Numbers 33 has all of that. But Moses is just picking up the highlights of events that really made a difference or there was a significant lesson being taught there. So they traveled from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water there for the people to drink. I mean, wouldn't somebody say, wait a minute, we've been through this before. If there's no water, let's trust God, he'll provide. But no, they start grumbling once again. And now they start quarreling with Moses and say to him, and the word there is strive. Uh, it, it means to complain or to find fault against Moses. Give us water to drink. Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? Because again, their beef wasn't with Moses. He's just the figurehead. Their beef is their heart still isn't trusting God to take care of it. So here's how I, what I gleaned from this. First of all, two things. Who's guiding them to all of these tough spots in life? Yeah. And you think, well, that seems obvious. Who guides you are, and is in control of the tough spots when you encounter them? Well, God forgot about me on that time. That's the reason I got into a tough spot. No. God is leading and directing your life even to some of the deserts, even to some of the tight, tight spots, because he wants to teach us our, our, how much maturity we need, still need to grow, and he wants to teach us about his heart. But the second thing is without the, word, the God's word in their heart, boy, their minds just started to stray. I mean, here they are. If they knew God's love for them, if they trusted God because he delivered them from slavery, why would they doubt he could provide water or food for them? And he's already done that repeatedly. 
But yet, when your mind starts to stray from the truth, then you get into all kinds of trouble. This is what they said. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried to the Lord, what am I supposed to do with these people? I'm sure parents can relate to that. What am I supposed to do with these kids, Lord? <laughs> In the verse in Matthew 22, <clears throat> where the Sadducees come to Jesus and give him this weird, bizarre, hypothetical story, and Jesus says, you're an heir because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. You don't know the truth. You, you, you aren't grounded in the truth. And I think Jeff's going to go over a pretty powerful grounding of the truth today from Romans chapter 8. But then he says, you don't know the power of God. You, you do not have a relationship with God. You don't understand his heart and how he can provide regardless of how difficult the situation is. And number two, God leads them to a barren place again. Why? Because he wants them to learn from these trials. It, it, do you ever find your life kind of going back into the same problem again and again, or you constantly go into a wrong relationship, or you constantly make bad business decisions over and over again? Th there's a reason for that, and God wants us to learn, to mature, and to grow up in our spiritual life, and he also wants us to truly experience his presence. Um, our daughter has been going through some struggles, and uh, we just said this is, this is going to be the best time for your whole life be if you draw really close to God, and that's what she was wanting to do. She had her Bible and everything. And <clears throat> Crystal said, you need to journal what you're going through because when the, in the future, you're going to look back and you're going to see that God came through for me. And it will be such an encouragement for your heart. Third thing is the enemy is seeking to destroy those that he can. Look what happened here. So they just got to Rephidim. There's no water. They start grumbling again. <clears throat> The word Rephidim means rest, but that, that's not what they were supposed to do in Rephidim because what's going to happen in Rephidim is they've already rested in Elam. Now they need to be ready for warfare, and they're not ready at all. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. So God gave them rest at Elam. Now they're still resting at uh, Rephidim. That's not what they need to do because now they're in enemy territory. They need to stay alert and ready. And the enemy was very strategic in his attack. Look at this from Deuteronomy 25. Remember when the Amalekites, remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. So he's, Moses is re-referencing this exact moment. When you were weary and worn out, then they met you on the journey and attacked all you who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. So two problems with the Israelites. They were weary and worn out when they should have been rested by now, and they were lagging behind, and of course the enemy has no fear of God whatsoever. So know your limits emotionally and physically. Um, you know, Mark 14, that's, that's the, uh, the story of where Peter was making his boast that all the rest of these disciples may you know, turn away from you, but I'll never turn away from you. And Peter was making a very bold uh, um, personal statement to the Lord and the Lord just said you're, you're so far out of your league here you do not understand the enemy that you're up against because you're dealing with pride because that's coming from a very proudful heart of Peter but he didn't know his limits emotionally and physically we need to be extra vigilant when you're tired or stressed have you ever made a mistake uh, spiritually business wise relationship wise when you knew you were at basically empty on your tank and that is not the best time to make a decision or to make a major life-changing change. That's the time to make me call a friend and get some prayer support desperately quick. And then the um, last one, stay close to the flock. I mean, yeah, like preaching the choir. I just preaching the choir because you're here. But it's interesting how the enemy picked off those that were lagging behind. He didn't go for the ones that were in the middle of the, of the pack. He went for those that were just drifting off to the side. <clears throat> Questions, comments, testimonies? Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. It's, it is just, I mean, could you imagine if we only met once every six months? Could, could you imagine how spiritually beat up you could be after six months? <clears throat> every week we need to gather to re-encourage ourselves. And the beauty of what we're trying to do with dinner groups and other, other fellowship that we're trying to do is try to encourage that even more to have those deep relationships, those friendships. Moses said to Joshua, <clears throat> so now... Moses is going to say, this is the plan to, to deal with these Amalekites that are attacking us. Choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. 
<clears throat> so God is wanting to work through our frail bodies. It's interesting that God didn't send his angels to deal with this. He sent some of the men with Joshua leading who are just frail, broken human, humans as well. I mean, th these aren't super, super giants here. Now, Joshua is going to have a faith that's going to be strong, but this is very early in his training. This is very early in his growth to be a leader. But we have these treasures in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. Sometimes God will break you because he wants you to learn to lean upon him more than you lean upon your own strength. And each person is going to be different. Life is primarily a battle against those that oppose God and truth. Be on your guard, stand firm in the faith, be men, be women of courage, be strong, and do everything in love. And I love how Paul writes that, 1 Corinthians 16. I mean, it's kind of like, be strong, don't give up, you know, and then do everything in love. Because we're, we're not out there with the sword slashing people. We, we have the sword of the spirit to fight in the spiritual realm, but we're not out there to be bludgeoning people uh, into the kingdom of heaven. We don't, we don't advance the kingdom by the sword. We advance the kingdom by pointing men and women to the cross. Understand our frailty and see the ever-present battle. And lastly, know where your source of strength really comes from. It's coming from God. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Do you want God's strength? You, God's going to make you weary. Do you want the power? He's going to make you weak. He's going to bring you to a point where you realize, I can't do it by myself, but through God, I can. And so, my soul melts from heaviness. Strengthen me according to your word, Psalms 119. And in the times of battle and stress, flee to the word. That's, uh, you know, that's why we asked our daughter, I said, where's your Bible? Boom, she had it right there. I mean, if she had to go digging in a closet and three, four boxes deep, and it's like, how often do you read this Bible? But she could reach it within two seconds. It was right there. In times of battle and stress, flee to the word. So here we go. Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning, but whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. And you're thinking, I thought we were doing a names of God study. Hold on, we're getting there. <laughs> when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side and one on the other, so his hands remained steady till sunset. I mean, imagine holding your arms up hour after hour after hour with a staff um, but it was so cool that Moses had that support Moses had that those that he could trust to do that work with him so Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword so even though we fight and endure the victory comes from the Lord and I thought that was so interesting it wasn't like Moses just went up on the hill and prayed this incredible prayer and then the bolts of lightning fell down and destroyed the Amalekites they had to actually get out there and physically do it as it relates to our time, we've got to be actively, physically, personally involved in people's broken lives. If you're, if you're not being involved in people's lives physically, I mean, spending time with them or, or getting to know their battles or struggles or failures or victory, you have to invest in people's lives. That's one of the main reasons God's left us here. That's one of the main reasons God developed, the, put the church together, the body of Christ, so we can learn and lean upon one another so, so desperately. The Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the name of Amalek from under heaven. Why do you think God wanted Moses to make sure Joshua heard what happened on that hill? Joshua's going to be the leader. I mean, do you think if you're down there fighting people and they're coming at you with swords and blood and every spears and all this, do you think you're like taking time to look back up on the hill, see if Moses' hands are raised? No. <laughs> Joshua, <clears throat> Joshua needed to be told that your victory came, yes, because you fought and obeyed, but because there was an intercessor for you. There was one praying for you. So then the Lord says this, Moses built an altar and called it Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up towards the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So here, Jehovah, the eternal, personal, present God, is my banner. Okay, I've got a flag over top of me. What does that mean? My banner is one of victory, strength, and hope. That really is what Moses symbolized <clears throat> as he's seeing this battle unfold, seeing Joshua and the troops engage the Amalekites, and then he realizes 
the victory is coming from the Lord. And the reason he, the banner concept is because the banner is what armies fight under. It's a banner of victory, it's a banner of strength, and it's a banner of hope. I mean, a banner represents allegiance, authority, or awesomeness. Now, good guys have banners, bad guys have banners. But again, what does the banner mean? What was Moses trying to um, impart to us with this Jehovah Nissi, this, this Jehovah, the eternal, personal, present God is my banner. He's saying that God, this eternal, personal, present God is your banner of victory. Joshua 1, he's your banner of strength. God enabled him to fight and not give up, and he's your, ba he's your banner of hope. There is a purpose for that battle. There was a reason there were men that got scarred. I mean, I, I, I doubt everybody came out of that battle scratch-free, but there was a reason. God wanted to let them know there is a hope. There is a bigger battle going on, and I'm going to win it, and I want you to be a part of it. And so, like I said, armies fight under a, a banner, uh, and what that symbolizes, their allegiance, to Christ, our authority is to under Christ, and our God is awesome. And again, I just showed you some just different pictures there, but our banner is the Lord God, Jehovah himself. So how do I apply Jehovah Nissi to my daily battles? And we'll start to wrap this up. How do I see Jehovah Nissi as my banner of victory, strength, and hope? Intercessory prayer. What was Moses doing on the top of that mountain? Intercessory prayer is what he was doing. This is so powerful. When I encounter opposition, frustration, disappointment, or various attacks, Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held his hands up, victory was achieved. I want men everywhere to lift up holy hands, in, not holy hands, but holy hands in prayer without anger or dissension. To you, O Jehovah, I call. Listen to my prayer for mercy as I cry out to you. I lift my hands towards your holy sanctuary intercessory prayer just just taking time to pray for the others the needs of the others um, is is such a key key element to build up the body of christ secondly prayer warriors i need the support and encouragement just as i can be an intercessor i need others who are interceding for me to support to encourage to keep accountable from other prayer warriors when Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone, sat him on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands. He had prayer warriors with them on the hill. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God to work. At Gethsemane, Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Why did he take Peter, James, and John? Not only because he was the closest to them, but he needed prayer warriors. He needed support, not just himself. Of course, that didn't quite work out too good, but the lesson's still there. And thirdly, Remember the past victories. I think so often we, we, we're quick to forget about all the times that God's come through for us. Um, we, we either don't write it down or we get old and don't remember it uh, or we're just lazy and forget about it. But remember the past victories. In my battles, I need to reread the word when God took me through and won. A lot of places in my battle, in my Bible, um, <clears throat> when there's a scripture that God lays on my heart for a certain person or for a certain event or for a certain uh, time, I, I, I'll not only write that note in it, but I'll put the date on it too. And that, boy, as I get older, I'm realizing that is such a help for me to remember and to jog the synapses that, oh yeah, God came through for me on that, that situation. That was a hill of victory. Even though there was a lot of battle going on, it turned out to be a hill of victory, strength, and hope. Then the Lord said to Moses, write this on a scroll as something to be remembered and make sure Joshua hears it. He needed to realize that you won because you fought and because there was prayer intercessors praying for you. We give thanks to you, O Elohim. We give thanks to you for your name is near. We remember your wondrous deeds, Psalm 75. And then Isaiah 25, O Jehovah, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name for you have worked wonders, plans formed long ago in perfect faithfulness. So how do I apply Jehovah Nissi to my daily life, my daily battles? Intercessory prayer. When I encounter opposition, disappointments, pray. And really be praying for others. Um, it's just amazing. All during the week, people come to me and their struggles, their battles, and I try to you know, actually take time to pray for them. Sometimes I'll send a text or something out saying I'm praying for you, or here's a verse. Other times I don't. That doesn't mean I'm not praying for you. But prayer warriors, I need the encouragement and accountability of a few that are praying for you and then remember the past victories. You know, just take some time to try to remember what God's done for you and how he's never let you down. Has it hurt? Yeah. Have you got some scars? Yeah. 
heartbreak, yeah, welcome to humanity. That's what it's going to be on this side. But he <coughs> redeems those broken scars. He, he has a purpose in those wounds. He brings good out of those things that the enemy means for bad. So Jehovah, my banner, is a banner of victory, strength, and hope, especially through intercessory prayer. Questions, comments? Absolutely. Thank you. That's good. Saturday night, five thirty. Six thirty. Thank you. Five thirty, come early. Five thirty, come early. Thank you. I appreciate that. My God, I, I, I'm old, and I've been through a lot, and I've come to realize it took me a while that all the things that I've had to walk through were not just for me. They were so that I could help others yeah. who are now going through it. Because I can say I've been there. Yeah. And I mean, it seems odd that God would use those lessons for us yeah. to teach someone else, but that's what he does. That's, that's just an excellent point. That's what Paul brings up in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 where he just says, you know, we go through these things so that we can be that comfort. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. I mean, how are you going to really comfort someone if you haven't even received the comfort for that battle or that scar? I'm not saying you can't empathize or can't relate or can't even pray, but sometimes God will take you through a deep battle, deep valley, so that you have a blessing in ministering to other people. And that's... That, that's when you start to realize and you can say, God, thank you for taking me through that one because now I see a blessing from that. Anyone else? I keep thinking of a song that was well, obviously Michaela across <coughs> my mom's life. Well, listen to it all the time, but there's a song by Benjamin Hastings, I think it's his name, Praise Him Anyway, and it says in there that um, when things are wrong, like he talks about a lot of things that can be wrong, he said, but praise Him Anyway doesn't change the circumstance, but it sure changes your heart. Yeah, it does. Thank you, Martha. And remember what I said, you know, I might need to do a teaching on this, but a lot of times people do these prayer chains and they just think if they can just get enough people praying, you'll twist God's arm and okay, okay, I'll answer that prayer. And that's, that's not what God is doing at all. What he is doing by having more people pray is he's just giving you an opportunity to participate in his power and his promise to fulfill and work in that area so that you can bring them praise. You know, the last thing you want to do is someone come to you and say, thank you for praying for me. You wouldn't believe how God did a miraculous healing. And, and you're like, oh, gosh, I didn't even pray for that person. Um, we pray to participate in God's work, not to not to try to twist God's arm to do something. Michael, um, I, I had a note in my book that um, the, uh, the word banner is spelled with the same letters as in the original um, text as test. And as I was thinking about it, it occurred to me, you know, banner is a, uh, a flag of, of victory, if you will. Mm -hmm. And if we could think about, uh, I don't think banner is a single banner. Right. Um, I think about, you know, what you're talking about, the, the tests that we have. We could in our lives, especially with journaling, uh, go back and find um, many different Absolutely. banners or tests mm -hmm. and where God has pulled us through and um, just be encouraged by that. Absolutely. Yeah, hopefully there's many banners of victory, yeah. banners of hope 
Um, and if you've walked with the Lord any amount of time, there there will be, <laughs> there will be. All right. Well, I think, Michael, one thing go ahead. I think about is, is it my mind or our minds about praying for what we want, mm. what we think we want. I think of Garth Brooks' song "Unanswered Prayer." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So many times, the things that I wanted, you know, thinking that that's what I wanted, and looking back on it, how bad that would have been, or, or how much more of a blessing I got because God took me a different direction, or took my family, or whatever. So. So sometimes people get discouraged with prayer because it doesn't turn out. And again, God's not a genie. You know, what, what kind of right. Issues. But I think that sometimes too that I've been blessed by things that didn't get answered the way I wanted to. That we did right. that way. Excellent point. And that's the heart of trusting the Father. That just He won't make a mistake. I mean, we as moms and dads, we make mistakes. We make decisions that oh, I could have done that better or could have done that a little differently. Uh, God doesn't make those mistakes. It's so perfectly mapped out, except we just don't have the plan yet. But we know it's for his glory and our good. All right. Father in heaven, thank you, God. Thank you that our Lord Christ is our banner of victory, hope, and strength. We are just overwhelmed with your love for us. It's just never-ending. It's new every morning, and we're just so grateful that you draw our hearts to you. Thank you, God, for your word today. Bless Jeff as he speaks on Romans 8 and give us hearts to hear. All for Christ. Amen.